All right, class. Welcome back to part C of this lecture, where we're talking about the origins of the elliptic model of planetary motion that, and spacecraft motion, of course, that we'll use in the rest of the course. <clears throat> in part B, we uh, had a sort of an in-depth discussion of the Greeks and how they invent Anaximander invented space and how there were heliocentric models of the universe, but they were discarded. Um, and finally, we ended up with uh, the Ptolemaic model, which can be seen as sort of an archaic, um, an archaic uh, version of what we now refer to as machine learning, uh, where we're fitting functions to data uh, using increasingly complex functions, right? And so the Ptolemaic model was developed um, originally by oh, Hesitis, uh, Hesitis, I, I want to say, and Hipparchus. And then Ptolemy added the equant and the eccentric to improve the accuracy of the model. And, uh, and that's where the model stood for uh, quite some time. Um, until, of course, we got, we come along and we get to uh, the beginnings of the scientific revolution. So this is actually fairly early uh, when we're talking about Copernicus here, 1473. We're not in the scientific revolution yet. Um, we're still sort of in the Middle Ages. Uh, maybe you can think of the Mahai Middle Ages, but we're still in the Middle Ages. Uh, things haven't progressed a whole lot from the Greeks at this point. The, uh, you know, the Greeks were conquered by the Romans, and the Romans weren't terribly serious about science or, uh, or anything other than engineering. And then, of course, the, the, the Romans were overthrown, and we lost most of the Greek works. And so there was a, you know, sometimes people refer to this as the Dark Ages and so forth. So we're still coming out of that pit, so to speak. Um, but as, as time goes on, uh, we're getting more data. Uh, the observations that people make are becoming more accurate. So the observations of those, uh, those uh, orbital, the planetary motions that we talked about through the zodiac. And people aren't, don't discard the Ptolemaic model, uh, but, in, but they have to add more epicycles. As we mentioned, right, you can show an approximation theory that you can match any planetary motion you like to if you had a sufficient number of epicycles. However, the epicycles get more and more complicated, harder and harder to use. They become bigger, right? They're the very large epicycles for the other planets. Uh, and so at some point, right, along comes Copernicus. And I'm not going to talk too much about Copernicus because I basically I don't know that much about him. But we have, we have better stories about the other, of other guys in this lecture. But along comes Copernicus, and uh, I guess he just gets fed up with uh, this Ptolemaic model, which of increasing complexity. And I guess he says, enough is enough, right? There's, uh, there's too many epicycles, they're too big, the whole system is, is, is too unwieldy. I don't want to really understand any, we don't really, not get, getting anything from this model. And so he says, well, what if we just put the, the sun at the center of, of the solar system? And this wasn't actually a terribly heretical idea. I mean, Copernicus himself is, is more of a monk than a scholar. Um, and so he does that and in, in makes the, the motions around the sun circular. And suddenly you require a much simpler model to fit the data, much simpler than, than that of Ptolemy. You still actually need a little bit of, uh, of those epicycles that we had before, uh, but they're smaller, much, much smaller, and they, they matter less. Um, and so the, the Copernican model, where there's a, there's a sun at the center of the solar system, and there's the Earth over here, and there's the moon orbiting the, the Earth, right? This was, uh, this was proposed not necessarily as a sort of physical explanation per se, and of course, a lot of these scholars had to sort of say, 
well, this is a model, but this isn't actually, you know, physical truth, right? It just, it works well for predict, making predictions. And so that's what he did, right? He, again, he was more of a monk than a scholar, and he, this is more of a metaphysical model than an actual uh, physical explanation of the, of the universe, but... Uh, but that's what that's what he did, and um, it, it wasn't completely rejected at the time. Although it was never universally accepted, it was accepted by Kepler, interestingly enough, but not by Tycho. Uh, it was a, and, and Galileo, of course, accepted it as well. Um, so this fits the the data a little bit better. It has it has you know phys metaphysical problems. Um, and, and there's a reason it took, you know, 1,500 years for it to, to develop. <clears throat> um, one of them, right, of course, being people had to get over the fact that uh, the moon is circling the Earth, right? You know, back in the day, right, the moon, it was fairly obvious that the moon was circling the Earth. Uh, the moon is actually the only body other than the sun that you can actually do anything with. You can actually measure the using parallax the distance to the moon. And so it's clearly circling the earth. And then there's no fundamental difference between the moon and any of the other heavenly bodies uh, that they could see. Uh, and so it made sense, right, that the that the moon would be orbiting the earth and therefore the all everything else is orbiting the earth as well. So Right there's there's a real reluctance to 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 make to make the leap to uh, to the to the the heliocentric model that Copernicus proposed. Um, there's also this uh, this small issue right that the the moon um, doesn't really rotate in the same way that the the Earth does. I mean it does rotate, but the, it's it's tidally fixed, right? So that uh, here's here's the Earth, here's the Moon. So that you have actually have a heavier part of the Moon, right? There's a, there's a slight, the Moon is slightly larger on this side, and so actually the uh, uh, over the the billions of years that the Moon has been orbiting the Earth, uh, it's acquired a rotation so that its face is always pointing towards the Earth, right? It's a tidally attracted to the Earth. Right. And so the, there's not really a precedent for a rotating body in space, even the one we can see doesn't rotate. And so rotating Earth models, again, were not particularly popular, even after Copernicus proposed his. The Tychonic model, in fact, we'll discuss that in a bit, was also not an, a rotating Earth model, although it fit, fit the data much better. So. Copernicus proposed his model, and we've probably all heard of it. Um, again, right? It's it. There's no proof, no no real uh, concrete evidence that this is the correct model. Uh, it doesn't sort of explain anything really that no, uh, that the Ptolemaic model doesn't. Um, and of course, we didn't have the. There were good telescopes at the time, so you couldn't really, none of this uh, evidence that Galileo came up with later was in evidence at the time. Um, there's nothing about, it's still, there's no ellipses, obviously, and the, the planets don't speed up and slow down, so there, there are errors, right? The same kind of errors that we saw in the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic model, which required epicycles. And so there are still epicycles in the Kepler in the, in the Copernican model as well. Aesthetically, though, metaphysically, it's in, in many ways more appealing. The motions of the planets are much smaller, right? So there, if you don't believe that planets should move very fast, right, this is a much better model from that perspective. And the, fa the idea that, uh, that things don't move fast has uh, some intuitive appeal. So, the, so Copernicus proposed his model back in the day, 14, uh, about 1500, and it was it was used, uh, but it wasn't. There was no real um, mass exodus from the Ptolemaic model until we come uh, we come along to Galileo. Uh, 
So, uh, although I didn't have a good, I don't have any good stories about Copernicus. the The rest of the, the rest of the people that we meet in in this lecture, uh, from the scientific revolution, all do have good stories, and I like retelling them because a they're interesting. Um, of course, the Greeks also were very, uh, you know, interesting interesting folks. It's just we don't have you know the detail of records that we have for these scientific revolution people like Galileo and Tycho and Newton and Kepler. Uh, basically because, right, remember the Greeks were taken over, we lost all most of the documentation, uh, the Rome was sacked and we lost lots of uh, documents that from there. And, uh, and only when um, these documents became available much, much later on do we actually learn that, uh, a significant amount about the, uh, the Greeks. By contrast, of course, all these uh, these scientific revolution folks we are very well documented, and we still have all those those records in writing, right? We have the originals and all, and, and so forth. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about Galileo. Um, so Galileo, hmm, what to say about Galileo? I mean, his contributions to astronomy, uh, to the elliptic orbit model, are not quantitative in a sense. Uh, they, he doesn't propose a, a different model, right? He, he's more or less, he, he goes with the Copernican model. So there's no new model of planetary motion proposed by Galileo. Uh, however, more, so, so, so the contribution of Galileo is in a sense more negative. He basically killed the Ptolemaic model and created an impetus, a real need for a new model. Uh, and he, of course, preferred the Copernican model. Uh, so what were what were this what were, what were these disproofs? What what did he he how did he kill the Ptolemaic model? Right. Um, so several of them, right? So first of all, uh, Galileo did not invent the telescope, right? But he built a good one. Uh, I say first decent telescope here. Uh, it was good enough that he could observe the um, uh, the planets uh, relatively well. So he trained his telescope on various things, wrote a book about it. Um, and the, what did he see? Well, first of all, he discovered moons. Right. So yeah, I guess he invented moons. Uh, so up until this time, remember, the moon is just a heavenly body. It's not a moon. We don't have this idea of moons, right? Um, until we get to Galileo, and he trained his telescope on... Uh, on Jupiter, and what did he see? Well, here's a here's a nice photograph which I took off the internet from the latest conjunction of uh, of Saturn and Jupiter, and uh, this is what he saw. Right, he saw Jupiter over here, right, and he saw these little dots around Jupiter, right, and he tracked those dots over long periods of time, and he showed that they revolve around Jupiter, and so what this shows is, of course, that Planets, uh, the, these these bodies in the solar system, right, uh, that we think of as planets now, uh, can have things orbiting them, right. So that these are uh, the, these bodies can have things called moons, and then from that observation, you can draw the conclusion that well, maybe that moon is not a maybe our moon, what we call the moon now, is not a heavenly body itself, but is actually just a moon around Earth, the same way that these little things are moons around uh, Jupiter, right? So, you know, looking in, looking through these telescopes and observing uh, the moons of Jupiter, right, he, he sort of gets away, allows us to, to distance ourselves from those conflicting observations about the moon, and uh, maybe the moon isn't, behaves differently. Uh, than, than the other planets do. So that was the, his first big bit of evidence that maybe the Copernican model actually has something going for it. Uh, the second thing that he observed, of course, and this is, comes back to Jupiter as well, but uh, he observed the, the phases of Saturn, right? Uh, sorry, of Venus, right? So he, he looked, trained his telescope. You can't see the phases of Jupiter as well as you can the phases of Venus. So if you look at Venus, right, sometimes when it's, uh, let's see, here's the sun, uh, here's the Earth, right? Uh, 
when the uh, when the earth is here and the sun is uh, here right the sun right uh, illuminates uh, sorry that's not, not a good illumination of venus so when the the earth is here and the venus is there the sun illuminates this part of venus and so the venus looks full however when venus is over here right the sun is illuminating this part of venus and so we the venus starts looking like the moon right when it had its crescent and gibbous and so forth or, yeah and so uh, this establishes that these heavenly bodies what we think thought of as heavenly bodies before just points of light in the sky which we could observe uh, are not actually just dots right they are planets they are they have their spheres right and so the observation that these things are actually large spheres um, made it made it showed that the um, planets right or the, the earth is just one planet among many right the spherical earth well we thought the earth was sort of unique but in fact uh, venus is looking a lot like the earth the earth could very well look like venus right and so that uh, that really that it combined with the moons of jupiter really uh, got rid of the ptolemaic model and called for uh, some uh, fundamental rework of, the, of our orbital model here. Um, Galileo did lots of other things as well. He's, he's well known, a very colorful character. Um, he uh, proposed a theory of the tides, uh, basically because he, the, he, he thinks the Earth is rotating, right? He proposes the Earth is rotating, as does Kepler, or sorry, Copernicus. And his idea was that, like the uh, that rotation of the Earth, right, was was forcing these seas out, like it's sort of like um, inertia. It do doesn't have a, a strong notion of inertia yet, but uh, he he proposes the tides are caused by the rotation of the Earth, which is which is actually not quite right. They're caused by right attraction to the Moon, but that's uh, that's that's we don't have that idea of forces that we we at this point that we do later. Kepler, by the way, proposed the correct uh, explanation for the tides. And of course, he's well known for getting in trouble with the church. Um, so let me talk, uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple other uh, things about Galileo's work, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so another thing he observed was uh, the sun. He pointed his telescope at the sun, obviously with a pretty good filter. And uh, he observed sunspots, right? Here's the sun, right? Which we just think of as this molten ball. And he, uh, there are sunspots, there are certain dark spots on the sun. And he observed them over a period of time and showed that they were moving, right? And what does that show? Well, that shows that the sun can rotate, right? About its axis. And if the sun can rotate about the axis, well, why not the earth? So all of these, uh, all of these things were published, and uh, uh, at this point, right, the Ptolemaic model is in, in big trouble. Uh, it, it doesn't explain any of these things, and so there's a real emphasis on the need for a re revision of the, of the model. Um, he uh, also made lots of contributions to uh, strength. He, he proposed the first beam model model of beams. Uh, what I like about his work, right, is uh, is this one down here. Uh, so he was uh, the first person to uh, come up with the idea of relativity. So he, using a thought experiment, no less, so real precursor to Einstein in that respect. So his, uh, his thought was that if you put a, if you're, if you're on a boat and uh, uh, the boat is moving at a constant velocity, on constant velocity, and you drop a lead ball off the uh, the mast of the of the uh, of, of the ship. It'll fall straight down, right? So that means that the motion of the ball with respect to the ship, even though the ship is moving, uh, behaves the same as if the the ship were not moving, right? It, they, the motion of that ball with respect to the ship is the same whether the the, the, the ship is moving forward or backwards or not moving at all. So this is the, the Galilean relativity version. 
Uh, this was actually uh, Einstein when he uh, came up with his notion of relativity. He was a big fan of Galileo, so he studied Galilean re relativity a great deal. Uh, and so his own thought experiments, you maybe see uh, these Einstein thought experiments about trains and the speed of light and such, were really inspired by this thought experiment of Galileo. Galileo never actually performed this experiment with the ships, right? Well, A, if you drop a lead ball off of a mast of a ship, it might go through the ship, so that uh, would be a problem. Um, and in fact, actually, uh, uh, it was funny. Um, uh, so if, uh, another thing to know about Galileo is, of course, he was a great writer. Um, so his, his language uh, really solidified the Italian language to some extent, and he still studied as one of the great Italian writers. Uh, but anyway, so in, in this in in this 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 writing uh, where he proposes this idea of relativity, um, uh, it's it's so, so it's all so let me say it's all in the form of dialogue, right? So up until remember we're at the end of the late Middle Ages, right? So uh, or high Middle Ages, depending on how you think about it. So the whole Middle Ages, everything, all scientific work was basically written in the form of dialogues, the same way that Plato. Uh, his uh, the uh, all of his works were in dialogues, people talking to each other, right, having a disputation between the two sides. Anyway, so the point was though that uh, he, there's a disputation, right, between these two guys. One is Simplicio, he, so he loves like using Simplicio, which was also a Platonic uh, device. So the sort of simple uh, guy who's arguing against Galileo, right. Of course, he's arguing against Galileo. You have to be pretty simple. Simplicio here. Anyway, so Simplicio says, oh, that's a nice thought experiment for Galilean re relativity, but did you actually ever try it? And Galileo says, uh, it's so obvious that one would not need to try it, right? It's a... Anyway, so Galileo is very, in some ways, is, it, it loves annoying people. Um, so he's very problematic that way. And in fact, actually, when you, well, the one thing you probably know about Galileo is he was imprisoned by the church, right? He was like, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, put under house arrest for the rest of his life. And why did that happen? It's again, one of his publications were in this dialogue, where he got permission from the Pope to like, to publish this thing. And um, the Pope says, well, you can publish this but only if you uh, include my counter argument at the at, at some point, where you know maybe this is just a model and God just makes everything happen. Well, on the very last page of uh, of the book, he includes that argument, but he it's it's an argument made by Simplicio, right? And Simplicio is supposed to be stupid, and so he's like making the Pope's argument in the mouth of Simplicio, so essentially he's saying the Pope is stupid for making this kind of argument. And that's why he was arrested, right? That's why he, so why he was, uh, uh, antagonizing the church is not a great thing to do, right? Copernicus didn't have that problem. In any case, uh, so um, Galileo was a big proponent of uh, trying to understand things, uh, how things work. Uh, not necessarily why things work, necessarily, uh, you know, there's no physics here, right? There's no mm, uh, force models, there's no inertia, and uh, things like that. Uh, but uh, he, he advocates uh, using mathematics to, to sort of translate these things. I, I, I have, there's a big, a nice quote that I, I like using, right? Uh, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, right? Uh, its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. And without these, one is wandering around in dark labyrinth. So again, trying to uh, take the technology that's been developed and saying this is more than just, right, abstract uh, uh, mathematics, this is how nature is, right? Nature is mathematics. Uh, so the models are, in, in, in a sense, this is one of the reasons he got in trouble, the models are reality, right? That uh, The nature is mathematics. Um, so 
again, Galileo didn't really come up. He was more of a negative person, very disputative, very uh, antagonistic. Uh, he came up a lot of arguments why everyone else is wrong, um, uh, and then, but didn't really propose a model per se himself. Um, although definitely his work uh, is very influential in, in, in the later, um, in, 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 by Kepler and, and Tycho, and, uh, and ultimately by Newton and Einstein as well. So Galileo showed that the Ptolemaic model has problems. Um, Ptolemaic model at this point here we're in 1546. This is contemporary with uh, with Galileo. Remember, notice that uh, Galileo is, is actually uh, younger than uh, Tycho, but but Tycho was of course influenced by by Galileo. Um, Tycho Brahe. Uh, so actually, the best stories um, that that I that I have probably are about Tycho. Tycho. Tycho is very popular among undergrads, I think, uh, especially at ASU maybe, um, because most of the stories about Tycho involve drinking uh, in one way or another. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and tell a couple of them. You can look at him here, right, and you can see that, right, I mean, that, that Tycho is, uh, I mean, if you, if you just look at that mustache, right, I mean, you got it. That that tells you about something Tico, something about Tico right away. I mean, this is a guy who would like uh, look at home like looting the capital, right? I mean, and giving what we know about Tico, I would definitely not put him past it. Um, all right. So what do we know about Tico? So what should we talk? Should we talk about Tico or the model first? Hmm. Um, all right. So let's talk about the model first, and then we can tell some stories about Tico. Uh, so the so the so the Tychonic model. Um, Tycho is a very social person, right? He's he's trying like not to offend anyone here. Uh, very nice guy. He's not as not like as uh, sort of profoundly antagonistic as as Ga like Galileo is. Uh, but basically, if you this model, right, the Tychonic model. It, it, okay, so let me say what the Tychonic model is. And the Tychonic model, by the way, Tychonic system was in use well up until uh, Newton's time. Um, so the Tychonic explanation, basically, even after Kepler's results were sort of published and, and accepted as a good predictive algorithm, the Tychonic model itself was still preserved. So anyway, don't, so don't dismiss it out of hand. Right? So basically, uh, the Tychonic model is still Earth-centered. Right, Earth is at the center, and the only difference between the so the, the, so that's basically the only difference between the Tychonic model and the Copernican model is that the Earth is the center. So Tycho said that, okay, yes, uh, the uh, uh, we'll 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 we'll. Say that the sun. St we're going to say that the sun still orbits the Earth, right? Because various reasons, but we'll allow everything else to orbit the sun, right? So uh, we have uh, the Earth. Uh, well, the moon still orbits. So the moon orbits the Earth, and then everything else, all the planets, orbit the sun. So that's kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> A sort of a compromise between the sort of heliocentric and geocentric. In fact, it was called geoheliocentric model. Um, but when you think about it, is this model actually that different than the Copernican model? Um, so the lines are all the same. Is there anything wrong with this model? Uh, so not actually, right? The the predictive power of this model, or sort of the uh, the model itself is actually almost identical to the Copernican model. In fact, there's no way of telling the difference. There's actually no observational way of telling the difference between the Tychonic model and the Copernican model, right? Because the only change is the, uh, the, the center of, the, of the, the origin of the system, right? So if we draw x and y axes, right? So 
x and y axes. Uh, here, the, uh, the, if we put, move the, the, the axis in the Copernican model from the sun to the earth, then that's the only change that needs to occur. Uh, all the measurements, all the, all the, everything else is, is identical. Uh, the only problem, of course, is that this is a, rot is a moving frame of reference. Right? So translation of the reference frame. And as we know from uh, Galilean relativity or Einsteinian relativity or uh, in the future, uh, translations of the origin do not affect the motion of the system per se. Of course, if we had dynamics, if we had differential equations governing all these things, those would be uh, uh, irredeemably lost, right? The, the force, but we don't have forces at this point. We only have positions and measurements. And so there's actually no difference between positions in the Tychonic model and the Copernican model. You use all the calculations from the Copernican model for the Tychonic model and nothing changes. So in this way, it, this is maybe just, uh, you remember like in, the, in the, the, the church, right? The church objects at some point to, it doesn't really object to the publication of these models, the Copernican model. Um, but it, it, what it objects to is saying this is how it actually works. This is what physically happens. So in a way, the Taconic model is a way of justifying the Copernican model by saying, okay, we're going to use all the calculations from the Copernican model, but we're going to say that's not actually how it works. Uh, so the physical reality is that the Earth is at the center. We're just going to use all the calculations. So in this way, Tycho is really just trying to make everyone get along, right? He's trying to like avoid that um, antagonism that, that Galileo had and uh, allow people to use the, the, the Copernican model without actually uh, changing anything. Of course, not that Tycho is, uh, is, a very, um, is not averse to antagonism, right? You can see that, right? He's got a, the fake nose, right? He's a very well known for a fake nose, right? This nose is actually made of gold. So he has a gold nose, silver gold alloy, alloy technically. Uh, he actually had several noses. Um, so he had a, a dress nose that he used for formal events. He had like a normal nose, which he used for like puttering out on the house because apparently gold noses are heavy. So he use, has a lighter nose. So he has lots of noses. Um, very colorful personality, but of course the physical explanation of this model is completely wrong, right? I mean, when you add forces, right, it just doesn't make any sense. But at this point, we're not dealing with forces, and so the Tychonic model as sort of a socially acceptable model was, was, was well received and, and almost universal. In fact, it was so well received that Tycho got in priority disputes with other researchers over who invented this model first. And in fact, uh, one of uh, the, the, we'll talk about Kepler later, and right? one of the poor jobs of Kepler was to uh, uh, try and write to write essays in support of this priority dispute. Uh, what was the uh, name of the guy he got into priority dispute with? Let me see if I can find that. Uh, Rothman. There was a, a guy named Rothman who proposed a similar model, and Tycho said, no, I did it first, and so there was a big priority Academics get involved in priority disputes. Apparently, it matters who discovers something first. Okay, so that's the Tychonic model. It's a it's a social model, really, a social adjustment of the Copernican model. Okay, so Tycho, right? Let's let's try and get in the head of Tycho. Oh, that's like fairly different, difficult. There are lots of good stories about Tycho, as I mentioned, right? So I'll try and mention a, f a few of them. Um, so first of all, where did he lose his nose? Uh, I, I don't, I'm probably doing this in a bad order, um, but uh, but uh, let, let me get started with a few stories. So how did he lose his nose? Um, as is customary with Tico, it involves a party and drinking. Uh, so uh, Tico was a student at Rostock, I believe, uh, university. He was in, in Denmark. Uh, he's actually related to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern from uh, Hamlet, if you're interested. Anyway, uh, so he's a, he's a student of uh, mathematics at Rostock University. And uh, apparently it's common for uh, 
professors to throw parties for their students. So the professor uh, throws a party for, for all his students. They all attend. And at this party, apparently, lots of alcohol was consumed. And uh, Tico got in a, a, a heated dispute with another uh, student, another graduate student of, of the professor, over who was the better mathematician. Now, this is a very serious issue back in the day, apparently, especially when you've been drinking. Um, and it came to the point that uh, neither Piedry were really willing to concede the point, and so uh, they fought a duel over who was the better mathematician. And apparently Tycho lost. <laughs> I don't know if he was the better mathematician or not, but he lost. And as uh, in, in the process of losing this, this duel, which is probably because he drank more alcohol than the other student, uh, he also lost his nose. So he uh, sliced off his nose. Uh, but uh, Tycho was a very wealthy nobleman in, in Danish court, and of course he couldn't afford to to, to, to print a new, new, new nose, right? So he, had, he resolved that problem. And he's known for having that, that fake nose. So that's, a, that's the first good story about Tico. Incidentally, uh, there's another good story um, about Tico. Uh, his father, right? They come from a line of... His very, father was a very, very famous uh, soul, uh, general. Anyway, uh, so how did his father die? Um, so his father died because apparently he was attending a party by the king. The king throw, through, through party, through, through, throws parties, just like Tico does. And um, the, the king apparently drank far too much alcohol and fell into the Copenhagen Canal. At which point, uh, Tico's father, uh, being you know, a, a robust guy and uh, very loyal, jumps into the, into the canal after, after the king, uh, drags the, saves the king's life, right? Drags him back to the shore and so forth. Uh, but apparently it's, uh, it's very cold in that North Sea. Uh, and so Tico's father uh, contracted pneumonia from this, this episode and, and, and died of that pneumonia, unfortunately. Right. So lots of good, uh, mostly drinking-related stories about Tico. Uh, so let's hold off on those drinking-related stories for just a moment to talk about, uh, besides proposing this model, uh, what Tico's work actually was, was about. Um, so let's see if I got like yeah. So, despite having a very bad model uh, and having a, a serious drinking problem, what Tico did have was very good equipment. So he's very popular, obviously, uh, with the Danish court, and uh, so the, the the Danish crown gave him an, an island to to do his little measurements. So why did he want an island to do measurements of of, of the stars? Well, um, similar to today, uh, there was a conjunction back then of the uh, planets Jupiter and Saturn. So the picture I just showed you recently was, was a picture of the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. They were very close together. Uh, so this was more or less predicted, but it turns out the prediction was way off, right, by, by months or something like that. And Tycho was very annoyed about this because apparently he had to stay up watching this conjunction every now, all the time. Anyway, so but the the fact that the this the predictive power of the existing Ptolemaic models in particular were so poor uh, led him inspired him so to speak to uh, get to, to develop a mechanism for finding much more accurate estimations of the star positions. So remember back to in the Babylonian times, right? They all they had lots of observations of the star positions, and so now we're back in the scientific revolution, and we're taking that you know the philosophy of Sir Francis Bacon and the experimentalists, and saying, well, we have all this uh, improvement in measurement theory and equipment, and let's apply that to measuring the stars as well. So he said, I need to do this. I'm going to measure the star positions very accurately, and so he asked for an island to do this on, an island in the castle. And, uh, and, and, and so the crown gave him an island, it gave him a castle, gave him all sorts of funds to uh, do his measurements, very accurate measurements. Five, his measurements are estimated to be five times more accurate than the most accurate measurements at the time. Now, he didn't use a telescope. The telescope was available, but it wasn't terribly accurate in terms of measuring uh, positions. Uh, so, in fact, uh, he, Tycho is known as the last of the sort of naked eye observers. Uh, 
of the stars. Uh, but that didn't actually stop him from developing very accurate measurements. And so this is actually a, sort of an image here of his uh, measurement in, in the castle. So, if I, so this is actually the below ground version. He had another version of this measurement apparatus, which was like uh, up on the top floor of the castle. But of course, the, the, the castle itself moves a little bit and things like that over time. And so he had to constantly recalibrate his equipment and so forth. And he said, enough with this. I'm just going to build a new observatory on the ground floor where the ground doesn't move as much. And so that's what he did. And so here, what he's doing, right, is he has this, uh, this measure. So there's a point here. You observe a star, and then you see where you measure it on this dial, and that gives you the angle to the stars very accurately, right, because uh, the amplification of the position that gives you very accurate measurement. Um, so, so, so the light comes in through the, in, in through the hole, and then you measure at what angle that, that light makes. And so you get very accurate positions. In fact, actually, that wasn't accurate enough, right, because there was atmosp atmospheric refraction. Uh, you know, when starlight passes through the Earth's uh, atmosphere, right, it gets bent a little bit. And so he had to actually compensate that for that. And that's using this, this very accurate equipment and compensating for atmospheric refraction is how he got his... Uh, his, his very accurate measurements. He, uh, he, incidentally, he, he very jealously guarded all of this uh, data for good reason, by the way. It's very expensive to like run this facility. It's not just give away his data. And people still don't, I guess, just give away their data. But it's very expensive to run all this, all this equipment. In fact, it, it was estimated in the 1580s when he was doing these measurements that uh, Tycho's Tycho himself was a line item in the crown budget, the Danish crown. And Tycho himself accounted for 1% of all revenue of the Danish crown. All of 1% of the entire revenue of the Danish crown went to Tycho. So very, uh, very expensive equipment uh, and very accurate measurements, which he guarded sort of jealously. In fact, Kepler, we'll talk about that later, um, joined his lab right specifically to, they disagreed vehemently on the actual model right kepler was a copernican uh and he uh, he believed right the opposite of tycho although but it didn't matter because remember the data fits both models equally well and so he he joined tycho's lab just for the purpose of getting uh tycho's data and of course once tycho died uh it was unclear what was going to happen to the data and so kepler just grabbed it and ran off uh, and then used it to produce his Rudolphine tables, which were, of course, very popular for their predictive power. In any case, so he would uh, catalog the, uh, uh, the, uh, all these star positions every night, make very accurate representations, and that, that allowed then uh, Kepler to refine his model and get very uh, a justification for his, his elliptic orbit model. And so I guess uh, since we brought up uh, Tycho's death, I guess uh, we can give another story on, about Tycho. Um, so Tycho's death, how, how, how did Tycho die? Um, so again, Tycho, you got to remember, A, loves partying, B, drinks a lot, three, ver C, very social. So, unfortunately, if you combine all these things uh, in, in a certain way, you get the, the nature of Tycho's death. I don't know if you can guess it already. Um, so, basically, Tycho had a big, an, uh, threw a huge party. Uh, he drank a lot at this party. And uh, he was having such a good time and didn't want to spoil anyone's mood that even though he really had to go to the bathroom, right, he really had to pee, uh, he decided to hold it, and the party went on and on. He was holding it and drinking more and more and more. And uh, eventually, right, the party went so long that, uh, and this is very rare, of course, uh, um, his bladder burst, right? He died of a burst bladder, and, uh, you know, we get urea into the, into the system. It causes death, right? Uh, almost no one dies this way, uh, on, only Tico, right? And I think that add some, ins some insight into his character, perhaps. Um, another good story involving Tycho and death, really, 
uh, is uh, the story of Tico's uh, party moose. Yes, Tico had a party moose. Uh, so he had a, a trained moose, a very tame moose, right? And whenever he got to invited to a party, he would, would take his, his party moose along and it would perform tricks and drink beer and do various things. Um, so unfortunately, uh, one day, or one, one, uh, one particular party, uh, Tico was, uh, you know, carousing with his moose and he allowed the moose to drink a little bit too much beer, right? So the moose drinks beer, apparently, as do all Danish people and mooses, apparently. Uh, anyway, so the, the, the moose drank too much beer and uh, eventually uh, decided it had, it, it decided it would use the bathroom, but being a polite moose, uh, left the party to do so and uh, started going downstairs and tripped on the stairs uh, because it was drunk and fell down the stairs and broke its neck. So, and that, that was the end of the party moose. So, uh, sadly, uh, you know, it, it, Tico had mo many offers for his party moose, but uh, never took any of them, and eventually he had to refuse them because of the death of the party moose. Um, so, gotta, you, you, gotta, you gotta love Tico, uh, I guess all the Danes at that point, uh, for, their, for their dedication to... Uh, to, 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 to Drinking and and partying and uh, at at significant risk to their health. I don't know what percentage of all um, Danes died of of alcohol involved fatalities, but uh, certainly I guess it was it was common in the nobility. Uh, a couple. Justifications, uh, besides the sort of just social aspect of moving the origin of the earth, uh, origin of the system to the to the earth and not the sun, is uh, is actually one is, which is much more justifiable. Um, so remember what I said about stellar parallax, right? So at this point. Uh, people could measure the distance to objects fairly well with stellar parallax, or for, with pal parallax. You could measure the distance to the moon, roughly speaking, with parallax. As the, right, as the Earth turns around on its axis from the beginning of the night to the end of the night, right, the, you've moved a considerable distance. And hence, right, you can observe the effect of that distance on observations of the moon. You can get a relatively accurate uh, distance to the moon. Right. In fact, uh, Tycho was uh, one of the things he's well known for is he actually measured the distance to a comet. Uh, here's a comet. Uh, and observe and show that it, the, the comet is actually very far away. Comets are very far away by measuring the parallax from night from beginning of the evening to the late evening. And show that actually it's beyond the, the sphere of, uh, of Mars. So that we have a, now a celestial body penetrating these spheres, so to speak. And actually, that is, so another use of, of parallax. And he looked very carefully, uh, very carefully for parallax, so for something which would differentiate his model from that of Copernicus, right? So specifically, he was looking for parallax. So in the Copernican model, remember, the Earth is moving around the sun. And so... From spring to, to, to fall, the Earth has moved a great distance, a very great distance in the Copernican model. And so you would imagine then, right, if you have various stars out here, that you would be able to measure that, the parallax, the distance to these stars, by taking this distance and calculating how much these star positions have moved. Right, so these, the, here these stars look like that, and here they look like Right, a little bit closer together. And he wasn't able to observe it. And that was why he, one of the reasons why he was so adamant about his model, because if the Earth was actually moving around the sun, you should be able to observe that parallax. And remember, he made very detailed observations and he couldn't observe the parallax. The problem is, of course, that the stars are so far away, so much farther away than the, than the planets, 
that parallax is very, very small, and no one could observe it. In fact, actually, no one observed any stellar parallax until actually 1863, where Bessel finally observed uh, some stellar parallax, very small stellar parallax. It wasn't until 1863, though. And so that was one of the, the big arguments of the only thing really that differentiates the Copernican model from the Tychonic model is that stellar parallax. And so actually the Tychonic model fits the data better than the Copernican model just because the parallax is zero for stars in, from what they could observe. Right. So again, right, we give Tycho a hard time. Maybe we don't take him seriously because he's such a party animal, but uh, we got to we got to admit, right? He did great things, right? He got these accurate observations. He proposed a model which fit best fit the data, quite honestly, best fit the data. And but he was wrong, unfortunately. Sadly for Tico, uh, we get to make fun of him now. And the but what, the person who who got it right, of course, is the next person on our list, which is Kepler, for which we for whom we have less inspiring stories, sadly. Uh, so Kepler, as I mentioned, worked with Tycho in the last year of his life, um, despite fundamental disagreements over their model. And, you know, given the, you know, the Tycho's model fit the data well, it's like hard to imagine why Kepler uh, loved the Copernican model so much, other than the fact that, like, there's so much motion in the Tychonic model, right? There's so much motion. The planets are moving so fast. And they, at this point, we know that they, they, they're sort of planets. And so I guess Kepler just had intuitively, I mean, in Galileo too, this idea of inertia, which they hadn't formulated yet. Although Galilean relativity is certainly a precursor to inertia. Um, so this, this idea of these planets ha should sort of intuitively have some inertia. And so they can't move around as much as Tycho wants them to. Tycho had no problem with it, right? Tycho is not like, it's much more experiment, uh, observational. He doesn't have uh, these ideas of forces that Kepler and Galileo are now having. Um, and so despite fitting the data better, Kepler and Galileo believed in the Copernican model where there's not as much motion. Incidentally, uh, just to give you an idea of how much motion there is in the Tychonic model, uh, which I didn't mention earlier, is that uh, the Tychonic model is not actually a rotating Earth model. So the Earth not only doesn't rotate about the sun, but it doesn't revolve at all. Uh, and so actually there's an outer sphere of these uh, stars or something, which it rotates every day. And so imagine like that these stars being so far away, right? They all rotate on a daily basis, right? It's just the, the accelerations that that would preserve are so astronomical. That, but again, didn't bother Tycho because, right? No idea of, an, no concept of inertia. It's just motion not differential equations. So anyway, Kepler, right, um, and Tycho disagreed over the model, but they worked together because there's no reason not to. Uh, the, uh, the data fit it works well with both models. And as I mentioned earlier, right, uh, Tycho did get in a priority dispute with Rothman over uh, with, who kind of came up with the Tychonic model better. Obviously, Tycho won because we called it Tychonic model, Tychonic system. Uh, but anyway, there was a big priority dispute, and uh, Tycho being, you know, the Danish nobleman and Kepler being his poor student, despite the fact that Kepler didn't believe in this model at all, was forced to make, write an essay about how, okay, this is a great model, and Tycho came up with it first, and accused basically Rod Rothman of plagiarizing Tycho's model. Incidentally, one of Tycho's students did actually eventually modify the Tychonic model to make it a rotating Earth model. But uh, again, it was sort of lost in the noise at some point. Right. And so that, uh, and at this point, then we, uh, we come to, uh, to Kepler himself, right? Um, so again, Kepler, everyone's going, is, is pretty much contemporaneous at this point. Um, assistant to, to Tycho in order to get that data, which he eventually published, right? And he sort of, I don't know if he didn't plagiarize it per se, but he came up with the, his Rudolphine tables. Now, what are the Rudolphine tables? Um, so the Rudolphine tables are not just, so remember Tycho had past observations, uh, observations of the, the stars as they were in the, in the past. 
Um, but what really people were interested in, in in looking at validity of models was predictions, where that conjunction of Jupiter and when that conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn is going to happen accurately. And that's what that's what Kepler that's that that was his great work. That's what everyone read was the Rudolphine tables. It took him a very long time to come up with them uh, after he left Tycho, right? The, even after he came up with this model of elliptic motion, right? Because uh, basically what the Rudolphine tables are, are a list of all the planets. It's sort of like it's a, it's a table, right? Right. It has a date. I should say date here. And so a bunch of dates and a bunch of planets Da, da, da. And where all those planets are going to be on those dates, right, going forward in time. Very important for astrology, right? And astrology was a big deal back then, right? So everyone wanted to know where the planets would be at certain periods of time. And so basically, uh, the Rudolphine tables are nothing more than Kepler taking his model and using it to predict the planetary positions, which is very, very tedious work. Uh, and so it took like 20 years for, for, for Kepler to actually um, come up with this Rudolphine tables. But when he did, right, he predicted it well into the future. Uh, I, I forget how many hundreds, uh, how, how many years into the future, but a lot. And uh, of course, uh, all the uh, astro astronomers in, 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 in the world were interested in where all these planets are going to be because they want to know where to point their telescopes. Um, and of course, do astrology. And so the Rudolphine tables are what really distinguished Kepler and made him a sort of a household name because we made all those predictions and they were all right. Um, right, so uh, when coming up with his three laws of motion, uh, three, uh, Kepler's three laws, right, these are primarily based on the very detailed motion observations of the motion of Mars. Uh, so remember, Earth is here, the Sun is here, Venus is here, and so uh, Mars here is here. So Mars is a little bit easier than Venus because it's an outer planet. We can observe it better for longer periods of time. Uh, so we have more data on Mars than we do for Venus. And of course, Jupiter is pretty far out, so in, in it, so it takes a really long time to rotate about the Sun. So we, Mars is a Mar, Mars. We get more data over a longer period of the orbit, right? I think Jupiter takes maybe 25 years or something. I'm not actually sure on that point to, to rotate. And so based, based on these observation of Mars, he uh, proposed these, uh, these, uh, these three laws of planetary motion, uh, which we're going to go over in a minute. Uh, furthermore, um, he actually, again, right, remember intuitively Galileo, Kepler, both had this notion of force. Uh, and so what he, he proposes, what keeps the uh, sort of the planets orbiting the sun is some central force uh, exerted by the sun. No differential equations yet, although there is a differential equation in those three laws, which we'll go over shortly. Um, but again, right, it's not quantitative. He can't predict the, uh, uh, he can't predict the, uh, the, uh, the, the period of these planets based on forces and so forth. Um, he used a, uh, he proposed a, a force-based uh, uh, theory of tides, uh, which is uh, basically caused by the moon, right? Central force, right? Again, not quantitative in the way that Newton was, but it, what he proposed that the moon did have a force and that it was uh, pulling those tides around. You know, Kepler was not, uh, not terribly uh, well-respected, not terribly popular, uh, by sort of the intellectual heavyweights of the time, Galileo and Descartes, Descartes and so forth. Uh, but because of the accuracy of his predictions, right, he, he can't be ignored, but he, he generally wasn't very popular, right? Um, and uh, to be fair, you know, he's a bit weird. Um, uh, so A, he's, a, he's a, Kepler is not an atheist, right? He has... He, 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 he's a Protestant, uh, he is, but he's profoundly religious, right? Uh, almost mystical. So if you remember the Pythagoreans, right, with their central fire and so forth, uh, the Pythagoreans were looking for uh, number theory in nature, right? So music, uh, 
uh, as numbers and uh, trapezoids and uh, using those to model the planets and so forth. And actually, Kepler, right, was big into this kind of stuff, right? And in fact, actually, one of his, uh, his first great work, before the Three Laws, of course, uh, was uh, based, again, on the uh, observations of the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, uh, but uh, basically saying that the, the, the solar system is composed of uh, regular polygons, basically, one inscribed upon the other, right? And here's your orbit, there's your next orbit, there's a polygon inscribed on that one, and so forth. Uh, complete rubbish, of course, because the radius of the orbits of the planets have nothing to do with any physical rule. Uh, he even actually took this a step further. He tried to cr compose music based on the uh, these numbers, uh, the distances to the planets and their motions and so forth. But, of course, it wasn't very good music. And so you got you kind of see why, you know, people are a little bit skeptical about sort of this mystical uh, Kepler guy. Um, but in the end, in the same treaties that he's proposing this weird planetary music, he's also somewhere buried in there is Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Right. Um, okay, and so I'm going to go through those three laws right now because we're on Kepler and it makes sense. Um, but I'm going to do it in, in, a, in part D of this, uh, of, uh, of this lecture. So I'm going to pause it now, give you a chance to take a break. Uh, recover from those stories, and then we're going to cover the three laws and uh, Newton very briefly.